Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today, we'll tell you about how the legendary BB King's personal items are set to go under the hammer. We'll also bring you up to date with MTV Music Awards that were recently handed out. Also, there are some exciting updates for Star Wars fans out there, but first. We'll discuss how the slave trade influenced American music. 400 years since the first Africans arrived as slaves to English North America. Exploration isn't always a noble venture. It's that time of the year again when one of the biggest film festivals in the world comes back to Venice. <laughs> How to land a masterpiece for your living room at just the click of a button. Around this time of the year, some 400 years ago, a ship carrying around 20 captives seized from a kingdom in Angola landed at southern Virginia. They were the first Africans to set foot in English North America. This is how the era of slavery begun in what would become the United States. As this month marks the anniversary of this travesty, we look at how slavery has impacted American music since then. Blues, jazz, rock and roll, hip hop. American music was largely shaped by the resilience and resistance African slaves showed under oppression. After most of them adopted Christianity, Sundays were considered a day of rest and a time for slaves to practice worship on most plantations in the American South. This meant they were allowed to play music, sing hymns and commune. In places like Congo Square in New Orleans, Africans used this allowance to play the drums. The rhythms and songs they learned from each other would go on to lay the foundations of modern gospel music and influence other musical genres such as blues, jazz and swing. Blues shows the transition from African slave to African American citizenry. In other words, the struggles faced within the aftermath of slavery. As for jazz, it developed from roots in blues and ragtime and today is seen by many as America's classical music. Jazz and blues, along with many other musical styles, also influenced rock and roll, a genre known for merging African musical tradition with European instrumentation. But the latest derivative of slave songs is hip-hop, which was formed in New York City in the 1970s. Don't push me, cause I'm close to the edge. It became a voice for the youth of marginalized backgrounds and mirrored the social, economic and political realities of their lives. Today, artists such as Kendrick Lamar Common and Childish Gambino release songs that feature elements of jazz, funk and gospel, while they speak directly about the conditions of African Americans just like blues did. Slavery inspired all of these musical genres and even more of them one way or another. It seems fair to say the influence of the cruel and dehumanizing practice has left a lasting legacy on music that's ever evolving. To unpack how the legacy of the slave trade has made it from the early music of African slaves to genres that have become the core of American music, 
Let's turn to Charles Birchall now in New York. He is the professor of music and culture at John Cabot University. Hi, Charles. It's great to have you on our show today. So, music was Hi. really important uh, to the slaves Thank during slavery. How so? Tell us, please. Well, music in African culture is just a part of life. It's, it's not separated from any other part of daily living. You know, it's, it's a part of rituals, but it's also a part of communication. So for the slaves, when they came to America, music was one of the few things that they could hold on to. Now, initially, they couldn't necessarily sing their traditional songs because just like, you know, America, there's so many different diverse groups of people. The same happened with slavery as you're taking people from different areas of Africa. So a lot of times they weren't speaking the same language, but through years and, you know, through assimilating to an American culture or colonial culture, they were able to learn other songs that they were able to collectively sing. These songs being the hymnals and spirituals of early Christianity. Mm -hmm. And could they sing these songs in their own languages? Well, you know, the thing about uh, slavery is that one of the key components to being able to get the slave population to to work and, and assimilate was that they had to destroy language. We had to break down these barriers. So a lot of times many of the slaves who were on plantations together were from different regions in Africa. So they couldn't really communicate in the same language or, you know, sing collectively. It's like if you take me, somebody from Turkey, someone from Afghanistan and, you know, someone from Liverpool and put us in the same room, we might not have many common songs to sing. But as they learned English and as they were able to be exposed to, um, you know, the English language, but also these songs, these hymnals, mostly through having church service. So the slaves had one day a week in which they were free to, from working, and that was basically to go to church and to learn Christianity, right? So in this sense, these songs were deemed acceptable. Singing songs in their own language was deemed unacceptable because, you know, their captors didn't understand the language, so they didn't know what they were doing. So it was really hard to retain their, you know, their native languages, mostly because of, you know, interacting with different cultures from Africa, but also because it was kind of outlawed. So when they learned English and assimilated these hymnals and things like that, they were finally able to express themselves completely through the music, you know, through the music of their oppressors. They were able to find their own voice. But I read your recent article and you wrote that this way, uh, it helped preserve African identity. But I, I wonder what the lyrics were also about. I mean, were there any secret messages, for example, in the lyrics of these songs? Yes. So when you look at early spiritual songs, they're telling the stories of biblical figures. Um, you know, they're telling the story of Noah, not, not Noah, of Moses parting the, the Red Sea and the Egyptians, uh, of the Israelites freeing, uh, leaving Egypt and, and finding freedom and finding the promised land. So a lot of the slaves would connect to these biblical stories because they felt the parallels and the similarities in their own experience, whether it's the literal freedom of getting free from slavery or metaphorical freedom of, you know, dying and going to the afterlife being the promised land. However, a lot of these songs became interpreted as messages once institutions like the Underground Railroad uh, were in place, which essentially was a way of secret passages to, for slaves from the South to get to the North. So songs like Follow the Drinking Gourd, which is essentially a talk, it's using the drinking gourd, you know, something that you use to get water, as a, a metaphor for the Big Dipper constellation. So it's understanding, okay, if you can follow the stars in the sky, you can find a map to the North and escape or songs like Wade in the Water, which is talking about a baptism, right? Which is talking about converting to Christianity, but it's also talking about if you're on this path going to the north and there are people pursuing you, hide in the water. You know, they would have dogs chasing them and all these things, but hiding in the water would kind of, you know, get the scent off of them, so they were able to hide. So a lot of these early spirituals, although the lyrics were referencing specific biblical things, they actually had secret messages about freedom and escape. Is it too much to say? Is it a bit of a stretch to say that today modern American music is sort of uh, an extension of the early slave music, directly or indirectly? I would say so. And the reason is because if you look at the way that most American music formed, it, a lot of it really comes from this mixing of African culture and European culture, especially in a place like New Orleans, which is where I'm from. You had a lot of people coming from Europe, various areas of Europe, Spain, France, and different areas, but also people coming from the Caribbean. So there was, um, there was a space for people to retain, especially African people, to retain their musical identity while also learning and assimilating European 
uh, musical traditions. That's why in New Orleans you have ragtime and, and New Orleans brass band music and the blues and jazz all kind of forming, which in, you know that inspired rock and roll, R&B, country music, funk music, and it, you know it continued to develop to the modern day styles like hip hop and all of that. Which is essentially, you know, you're taking these stories, you're taking this idea of, of, of freeing yourself from oppression and you're combining it with these African rhythms, but you're u using European harmonic concepts. Absolutely. I think the moral of the story is that great art can flourish, even under, under the worst circumstances. Thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. Unfortunately, exactly. this is all the time we have. Thank you. Thank you. And now for a quick look at some other stories from the world of the arts and culture. If you ever wanted to get your hands on a very famous guitar, now is the time. One of the iconic Gibson electric guitars owned by the King of Blues, B.B. King, is set to hit the auction block. King has long been associated with the trademark black Gibson guitars all of which he christened Lucille, in honor of a woman who two men fought over in Arkansas in 1949, where King was playing. The auction also features other items from the King estate, including a National Medal of Arts presented in 1990 by George H.W. Bush. The sale will take place in Julian's auctions on September the 21st. The stars came out for this year's MTV Video Music Awards. Missy Elliott, who released a surprise album on Friday, received this year's Video Vanguard Award. With this, she joined the ranks of names like Beyonce, Janet Jackson and Madonna. Starting the night with 10 nominations each, Taylor Swift won Video of the Year and Ariana Grande was voted Artist of the Year. And Disney Lucasfilm whet the appetites of fans by sharing their exclusive trailer for Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, the final film of the latest Star Wars trilogy. That trailer was released at Disney's D23 and it is now available to all Star Wars fans. The trailer contains a generous amount of footage from the past Star Wars movies and hints at how the eight previous films in the franchise come down to what will happen in the final installment. The film will be out on December 20th. Although Venice Film Festival is the oldest in the world, it has kept its reputation of being a trailblazer. This year's 76th edition is proving that once again. It's underway with a notable lack of female directors and controversial slots for Roman Polanski and Nate Parker dominating the build-up. But nothing overshadows the exciting and long-awaited program, as showcases Hatija Maryam Gelger explains. He was a pioneer. Last year saw Ryan Gosling become the first man on the moon in First Men. And 2019 is the year Brad Pitt is sent to the farthest reaches of space to save the Earth from a mysterious force in Ad Astra. I am attempting to stop an uncontrolled antimatter reaction that threatens our entire solar system. In this new space epic, director James Gray says he wanted to feature the most realistic depiction of space travel in a movie. Spacecom believes my father is responsible. What I love about Nicole. Loving you. She's a great dancer. Last year's Golden Lion winner, Roma, proved that Netflix films can grab some of the most coveted awards. She gives great With this boost of confidence, Netflix has released three new movies debuting at the festival. One of them being Married Story, which follows a couple going through a difficult divorce, starring Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver. Push me. Joker by director Todd Phillips is also among the highly anticipated releases of the year. Phillips calls this new profile of the old villain a true character study, with Joaquin Phoenix as a failed stand-up comedian who ends up becoming a psychopathic criminal mastermind. What's so funny? Just... Freak! <laughs> 
You look like a different person. What have you done with my daughter? I killed her. In previous years, the festival was called out for featuring very few women-directed movies. This year's lineup is once again being criticized for lack of balance and diversity. Of the 21 films competing for the best film, only two are directed by female directors. Shannon Murphy's debut Baby Teeth and the perfect candidate from Saudi Arabian director Haifa Al Mansur. In recent years, the Venice Film Festival has garnered a reputation for foreshadowing the upcoming Oscar winners. But with the inclusion of controversial director Roman Polanski and actor Nate Parker in the lineup, the event is likely to become a hotbed for heated discussion this year. Now, to unpack this year's Venice International Film Festival program, film critic Esin Küçüktepe Pınar joins me in our studio. Hi, Esin. So, tell us about the controversy about gender parity. There are only two films by women, right? Exactly. I mean, Venice is always uh, like this. Fails, you know, gender equality or everything else. Because this year, Cannes was like four women directors in the main competition, and Berlin was seven. So, the comparing with that, uh, Venice again. I mean, comparing with last year in Venice, there was only one woman, the woman director. So, this year is doubles, like two, but, you know, still, it's unfortunately... Uh, but uh, the jury president, the main competition, Golden Line Award uh, jury, is thankfully is uh, uh, headed by Lucrecia Mata, an Argentinian director. She's enormously talented. And she's, you know, she's a good filmmaker. And we are happy, at least, you know, she's the uh, head of a jury. This. And lots of controversies, as we uh, just mentioned. Roman Polanski is another one. Oh, yeah. uh, the lineup includes, uh, includes his latest uh, drama. How do people approach this? I know, it's, it's a bit weird. Venice is, and the Cannes, they always try to do some scandal thing. I think that the, one of the scandals uh, of the Venice this year is a little bit this one. Because the movie called The Jacques, it's, you know, uh, from the title, it's, it's a very important Murphy affair from the uh, 19th century France. So some G, the captain, was wrongly, falsely convicted for being spy. But then, he was clear. So maybe the Polanski is trying to retrial his own, you know, sexual conviction back mm -hmm. in the U.S. whatsoever. But yeah, this is unfortunately one of the um, yeah. tricky ones. In, Some people are reactionary yeah, against right, that. And speaking of the um, rivalry, may I say, between Khan and uh, Venice <laughs> Film Festivals. That's true, yeah. Uh, Netflix, I want to talk about Netflix, yeah. because their approach, Venice Film Festival's approach towards Netflix is quite different than Khan's. Do you think, um, does Netflix continue its romance, mm -hmm. may I say, with, uh, it with might. Venice? It might, because, you know, actually, the one good thing that uh, the, the protection law about the cinema in, back in France, it's very good, very strong. But in this modern world, it's also very, you know, um, conflict. It creates conflict because of the streaming online and, it, you know, the good old theatre kind of cinema uh, watching mm -hmm. experience. So, yeah, the France, the Campion Festival couldn't handle the controversy. So they said no to Netflix, but Venice would be, wouldn't be much happier. So, yeah. To this year, there are two uh, two American independent directors, so-called Soderbergh, with a very uh, political title, mm -hmm. um, El Laundromat, and then about Panama Papers. Yes, that's very very political, and the Meryl Streep lead. So that's that's quite a controversial title. But the other one is we all like him now. Uh, it's a marriage story. Yes, and then that's also interesting. Okay, one more question before we wrap up. Yes. Tell us about the opening movie. Wow, Corrieda, we all love him. Ed admire his cinema. You know, he's got Golden Palm eventually last year with Shoplifters. But, you know, I have a little bit 
um, I'm a little nervous because he's now in unknown territory in Europe, in France, and uh, two French diva, um, <laughs> Catherine Deneuve and Juliette Binoche. It's the movie in French. So we love him and we admire his courage to go to Europe, unknown language. Uh, so we are looking forward to it, but also a little bit. Must shaky. have been challenging for him. Let's see what he came up with. Thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. Thank you. Collecting art has traditionally been associated with the rich and powerful. Even today, the most famed masterpieces are usually in possession of private collectors and sometimes even locked away from public. But a new innovative collaboration is transcending that barrier, making famous artworks accessible to us all at just the click of a button. Showcase's Saloma Van Sil finds out how this works. Ever walked out of an art gallery wishing you could bring home one of the masterpieces on display? Perhaps a 19th century Van Gogh or a 15th century Botticelli? Well, look no further. Thanks to a new collaboration between South Korean tech giant Samsung and the Royal Museums of Fine Art in Belgium, you can do exactly that. We are participating in the Samsung initiative because we think uh, technology has a lot of possibilities uh, to uh, spread uh, our heritage in another way than in the museum. So with Samsung uh, frame, we can bring the artwork into the living room of the people. The frame is both a 4K smart TV and a digital canvas. So instead of fading to black when the device is switched off, it displays art. And with over 1,200 masterpieces at your fingertips, you can abandon and acquire to your heart's desire. It's uh, subscription-based, so you have two formulas. Uh, either way, you pay, you pay either five euro a month and you have unlimited access. So I, I always, personally, I call it the Spotify of art. The brightness sensor uh, measures the lightning in your living space and based on these uh, results, it adapts the backlight of the panel so it would really look like a real picture. This is not the first partnership between Samsung and a major art institution. The Tate Gallery in London, the Uffizi Museum in Florence and the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam have all struck deals with the tech giant. And you can see why. There are a lot of challenges for the museums because the museum of tomorrow, we have to think about it. Before you had only the physical museum, today we have also the digital museum. People are used to, to have digital images and we have to develop this whole digital museum uh, today as well. There is a challenge also that we have a lot of more museums today and a lot of uh, competition between museums. So we have to do better every day. In order to compete with new technology, museums have to adapt or die. But this is yet another example of how the old and the new can collaborate to create something that can transcend not only time, but also space. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. But before we leave, let's take one last look at the enduring impact of the slave trade in North America. But this time, let's talk about its reflections on film. Dozens of filmmakers have told slave stories over the years, and we've gathered some of the most remarkable choices for you. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. or this Confederate peace, you cannot have both. How many hundreds of thousands have died during your administration? Congress must never declare equal those whom God created unequal. Leave the Constitution alone. We are stepped out upon the world stage now with the fate of human dignity in our hands. Blood's been spilled to afford us this moment. Now, 
Now, now! I need your help. I'm looking for the Brittle Brothers. However, I don't know what they look like, but you do. <laughs> How do you like the bounty hunting business? Solomon Northup is an expert player on the violin. I was born a free man. Well, boy, how you feel now? My name is Solomon Northup. I'm a free man, and you have no right whatsoever to detain me. And that servant that don't obey his lord shall be beaten with men. <laughs>